Hello, this is Jonathan Chapman speaking to you this morning on behalf of Jim Chapman, who is currently convalescing. It is an honor to be with you today and to have this time of devotion together. I wondered if we might just bow our heads for a moment in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to share together to make use of the technology that you have made available to us. We thank you for your guidance during this time, Lord. We also thank you for the many blessings that you give and would ask, if you would, guide my words today so that they might reflect your word and your will. In your son's precious name I pray, amen. One of my favorite hymns is, It is well with my soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, In our current day, we tend to think of ourselves as being a generation like no other. A generation that experienced what we perceive as unprecedented times and events in our day-to-day -day lives. I believe, in part, this mindset results from the rapid development of our technologies leaving us with the impression that somehow our experiences in these times are totally unique. But the more we acquaint ourselves with history, the more we see events that are analogous to our present day circumstance. And such is the case with the disease that's now gripped our world and has changed the course of our physical interactions. So why don't we take a few moments Let's see what God's teachings were over the course of time in both the Old and the New Testaments about 
situations like the ones that we're experiencing right now. First, God gave Israel laws for managing life together, including what can be read as personal hygiene regulations to ensure public sanitation. These were all predicated on the premise in the Torah of loving one's neighbor as oneself. In the 13th chapter of Leviticus, it lays out the laws concerning leprosy, a large group of infections that uh, had skin diseases of varying severities. It consisted of a 14 day quarantine that was divided into two seven day examinations to determine if the disease was a threat to the greater community. Now, if someone tested positive, he or she had to publicly declare themselves unclean. Priests had very clear and well-defined spiritual functions. They actually operated as custodians of public health, assessing the threats for the greater community and society, which was pretty progressive for 1500 BC. But you can actually read in 2 Chronicles, in the 26th chapter, how King Uzziah had to live out his days in isolation once he was confirmed to have leprosy. Even in the New Testament, lepers practiced a form of social distancing. That's what we're told in Luke, in chapter 7 when it talks about a group of 10 lepers that stood far off as Jesus approached their village and cleansed them. There were no kisses, no embraces or high fives that could be exchanged. It was literally against the law. God had mandated these laws well before medical science could explain the reasons behind them. The Mishana is the first major written collection of the Jewish oral traditions that were known as the Oral Torah. It's also the first major work of rabbinic literature and it added rules for triaging cases of leprosy. And the Mishnah speaks of how and when to quarantine how to confirm positive cases, and how and when to declare someone clean, and then reintegrate them back into society. If the wind was blowing, no leper was to come within 100 cubits or about 150 feet of anyone that was not similarly infected. Now we move into Christ time. In Christ's day, Lepers were required to live outside of a camp or a city. No leper could live in a walled town, though they might in an open village as long as they kept their distance. But wherever the leper was, he was required to have his outer garment torn, to go bareheaded, and to cover his beard as a sign of mourning for his own death. However, Jesus' approach signaled a way to mitigate an infectious disease. His compassion on those who were suffering is evident in Matthew in chapter 8. But even there, Jesus insisted that they go through the established health system of priestly examination, as was outlined in the law in Leviticus. That was for two reasons. One was to have them not only physically, but spiritually delivered clean. And as a testament to Christ's healing touch. Now, quarantine life has many challenges. We know that from our own experience. But the Bible tells us that within every adversity lies an opportunity, a seed of hope waiting for a divine living water and the light 
of our God to bring it to life. So what is there in the scripture that helps us not only to endure, but to thrive during this time of isolation? The Apostle Paul's third missionary campaign ended in Jerusalem as he, along with others, brought to the holy city a contribution for the poor of that region. Paul was happily welcomed by the faithful in Jerusalem, but they presented him with a problem. His reputation had actually preceded him. The report had spread that the apostle was antagonistic to the Jewish systems. And in order to discern a very volatile situation, Paul actually agreed to submit to a ceremonial cleansing in the temple. Now, this was the custom for Jews at the time who had traveled amongst Gentile lands. This very considerate gesture didn't appease the Jews. Paul had already been seen in the city with a Gentile from Ephesus. So a rumor quickly spread that the apostle had taken Greeks into the temple and thereby defiled it. And that was a capital offense. So before long, the city was aroused with a lynch mob mentality that would rival what we see in the violent demonstrations of today's cities. Paul's life was saved only when the Roman officials intervened and then removed him to safety. Eventually, under a heavy guard of 470 soldiers, the apostle was taken to Caesarea over on the coast where he was confined in Herod's palace and was then subjected to a series of, of interrogations. Then, finally, after two years had elapsed, Paul concluded that he would never receive a fair hearing under those circumstances. But he had a right as a Roman citizen to appeal his case to Caesar, the equivalent of our Supreme Court hearings. We know from 1 Timothy, Titus, 2 Timothy, that Paul was then released and then preached for several more years before being imprisoned yet again. Rather than being housed as a common criminal, the apostle was permitted to live in his own rented dwelling. Although he was bound with the chain and had to be in the company of a guard. And you could have imagined the inconvenience of actually assigning guards to his imprisonment. It was a significant cost, but it does demonstrate the importance of Paul within that city and within that region. So by studying his final letters, the first Timothy, second Timothy, Titus, we're able to see a pattern of behaviors that characterized Paul's enforced isolation we also see how he coped with that and what sustained him during this period of isolation. Sometimes a few words or phrases of encouragement from others speak volumes into the lives of those that are enduring isolation. In Paul's case, there was Luke, Timothy, Onesimus, who was a slave from Colossae, Mark, the son of Mary, and a cousin of Barnabas. There was a fellow by the name of Jesus Justice, a, a valued Jewish co-worker. Then there was Epaphroditus, mentioned only in uh, the Philippian letter, a man of a pagan background out of Philippi that somehow converted to Christ. There were others. So the question is, are you a friend to those who are imprisoned in this isolation? Have you continually reached out to them? How many times a week do you send along a kind word of encouragement, a gentle hand of friendship, or an item of wisdom from the scripture to help them through this time? By weaving together the information found in Paul's prison epistles, we get some feeling about how he managed not 
just to endure the isolation and restrictions that were imposed on him, but how he continued to worship and work for the gospel throughout his confinement. Another accomplishment of Paul was that he used his influence for the gospel fully to the extent that he had an opportunity. So as a prisoner, Paul became known throughout the whole proletariat guard, it says. The proletarian guard was a body of 10,000 specifically selected soldiers. And they were in Rome. They had unusual privileges. This was the cream of the crop. Their privileges actually included double pay. And they became so powerful that even emperors had to court their favor. But the apostles' influence went beyond this group into what the scripture says is all the rest, which probably indicates that his reputation was known throughout the entire city. Amazingly, there's even a reference to saints in Caesar's household. Because it says those in and about the emperor's palace. So, during his isolation, the gospel had penetrated deep into the heart of the city. Through Paul's example, the majority of Roman Christians, it says, were more abundantly bold to speak the word of God without fear. Paul also spent time writing letters that were aimed at a number of purposes. The letters that Paul wrote while a prisoner in Ephesus or in Rome are the latest of Paul's writings that are preserved in the New Testament and consequently they act as a map or a guide for us to use as we navigate through this time of isolation and unrest. The epistle to the Philippians is an informal piece of correspondence that Paul sent in response to a gift that he had received from the church in Philippi. Now, knowing that Paul was in prison and, and probably in need of material benefits, the Philippian church had sent one of its members, Ephroditus, with a gift of money and the intention of staying with Paul to assist him in any way that he could. However, Epaphroditus became ill and had to return home. So Paul sent this letter to the church of Philippi with him. The letter in turn served as encouragement. Paul is encouraging the people of Philippi to live out their lives that are obedient to God and uplifting to one another. Paul wrote this letter while in isolation, not only to strengthen the fellowship, but also to tell the churches how he was doing. Paul spent his entire imprisonment pleading for unity in the church. It's a sad commentary that during this time of isolation, we hear reports of churches that are on the verge of split over how to deal with the pandemic or how politically to deal with the outcomes that are caused the virus. Unity is more than just a an absence of fighting or an, an atmosphere of friendliness. There is unity of truth because truth is consistent. This is why we are encouraged to all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions amongst us, as it says in 1 Corinthians in the first chapter, verse 10. We are also to be perfected together with the same mind in the same judgment. Now, some may think that that means we have to agree on everything. Well, not really. While unity is not easily achieved in a society of people with everybody having their own opinion, it still has to be vigorously sought in our churches and in each fellowship. Diversity doesn't apply to spiritual truth. And this is why we defer to the scripture rather than societal norms or opinions or political norms or acceptances. I believe this is why one of the pillars of the restoration movement was the phrase, where the scriptures speak, 
we speak. Where the scriptures are silent, we're silent. That doesn't necessarily mean we have nothing to say, but we must be very careful to distinguish between what the scriptures provide and what our opinion of that is. We may not always agree of how best to handle the ills of this pandemic, but we can concentrate on how we can live together with our diverse opinions of how best to function physically, emotionally, or even spiritually. We use this time, as Paul did, to witness to the power of the Holy Spirit and show your neighbors how to thrive during this time. You have a time like no other to demonstrate what the Holy Spirit can do within our lives. I'm going to play you a song that speaks about where we put our trust. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My come. My all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then first and forth in glorious day, up from the grave he With the precious blood of Christ. Oh, no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath. We say a word of prayer together. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for those who have given us a path to follow, those who have walked through this shadow of death before us, and yet they have persevered and thrived. I pray, Lord, for unity in our churches. I pray that we can demonstrate to the world how Christians help not only each other, but our world in the way that we treat, not just the virus, 
not just our church, but our enemies as well. Give us the grace, the understanding, the wisdom to use this time well so that all things might come together to bless your church, to bring glory and honor to your name. And it is in that name that we pray the name of your Son. Amen. My hope is that soon we will be able to worship physically together. But until that time comes, may God grant you the wisdom, the energy, and the resources to serve him and his church well. Amen. As is our practice, I would like us to participate together in the taking of the Lord's Supper. It is written that the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. We Christians pray to God all of the time, sometimes early in the morning, before we eat, at night when we go to bed, sometimes when we're troubled or afraid. You may not realize that Jesus prayed specifically for you and for me. On the night before his death, just before he entered the Garden of Gethsemane, it recorded what Jesus said in the 17th chapter of John. It tells about Jesus speaking to God, asking the Father to glorify him. And then next, he prayed for the faith and courage of his closest disciples. Then finally, Jesus prayed for all of us who have come to faith because of the apostles' writing and teaching. In part, this is what the passage says. Jesus looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, he said, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have full measure of my own joy within them. I've given them your word and the world has hated them for they're not of this world any more than I am of this world. My prayer is not that you would take them out of this world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. My prayer is not just for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through the message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So now we come to this time, in this hour, in this place, we who are gathered here have been blessed by the personal prayer of God's own son. He pleaded with his heavenly father on our behalf. Then he gave his own life to seal the request. If it is true that the prayers of the righteous produce wonderful results, then how much more will the prayer of the one who is most righteous accomplish and protect us? Shall we pray? Father, we know how your son pleaded with you on our behalf just before he willingly gave his life for us. Please help us to remain faithful and through this act of communion, continually remember his sacrifice and honor his prayer through our love and obedience to you as your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread 
blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body, which is given for you. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. He gave it to them saying, this is the blood of my covenant shed for the remission of sins. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you show forth my death until I come. Heavenly Father, even though we might not be able to gather all together at the same time, strengthen our faith. Help us to honor the prayer that was offered on our behalf by your own son. Keep us safe, Lord. Please help us to remain safe in the bosom of your love. Help us to spread the word of your gospel and to be examples of what it means to follow Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. I trust that this is going to be a week where you can enjoy the opportunities that the Lord puts in front of you to reach out to your neighbors, your community, and to your church to better serve Him.